Hi. Hi. You're listening to Cultivate Curiosity, a podcast that inspires the next generation to stay curious. Cultivate Curiosity is brought to you by the Emerald Coast Science Center, a nonprofit interactive science museum and STEAM educational facility in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. This podcast is perfect for anyone curious about the world we live in because you never know what we'll talk about next. Hi, my name is Harley, and I'm an educator and the community affairs coordinator here at the Emerald Coast Science Center. Hi, my name is JC, and I'm the social media coordinator. Hi, my name is Diane, and I'm the director. Today, we're going to be discussing misconceptions of museum funding, and this is something that's really near and dear to my heart. There's a couple things. I'll start out with this story from years and years and years ago. I was at a community event, and it was at the hospital, and they were showcasing a new robotic surgery equipment, and one of the doctors there was talking to me about it and everything. I was like, oh yeah, that's so cool. This is so neat. Wouldn't it be really great to have something like this in a science museum? You know, I run the local science museum and he goes, well, all my taxpayer money goes to you anyway. And I didn't think about it at the time because I didn't have a response to that. And obviously, I still think about this because it's been a minute since that event actually happened. But I think the misconception is that museums are fully taxpayer funded. And that is absolutely not the case for us. Now, there are some museums, even some museums here locally, that are taxpayer funded, like the Indian Temple Mound Museum Complex, that is actually owned, managed, operated by the city of Fort Walton Beach. So the people that work there are actually city employees. So they have a totally different set of operational objectives and financial situation than some of the other museums that are here locally. So just to give you a heads up, even all of the larger museums aren't all, you know, taxpayer funded. For an organization like us, we're completely independent. So we have to figure out how to pay for everything that we do. And one of the things that we have really been focused on since we moved into this location in 2014 is growth. And so everything that we do, we turn around and if we have, you know, $10, we try and put it right back into the museum to figure out how to make the museum a better place. And I think if you've been with us for any amount of time, you've seen that growth. We're coming up on 10 years. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But it takes a lot of effort and finding funding from a lot of different places. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we get that funding, where it comes from, and one of the huge disappointments that we were hit with this summer. As I said, we're completely independent, so we have a mortgage that we have to pay. We have purchased our facility from the city. So that's the first thing out of the gate, right, is we have to make a house payment every month. We do have professional staff. People ask me all the time, well, can't you just get volunteers? Why do you have to have (laughs) staff? Well, you need reliable people. You know, all of our educators have to go through a level two background check check with the school district, you know, so they have to be fingerprinted. We have to know that people that we are putting in front of kids and families know how to manage behavior Mm -hmm. of kids. And do Uh, you really want a volunteer to train other volunteers to make sure they're good to go? It's a lot. It's a lot. And we do have some amazing, absolutely amazing, wonderful volunteers here that we couldn't do what we do without them. But then you also have got to have paid staff because I need people to work on Saturdays. And, you know, (laughs) that's, you know, a lot of times people don't want to do that unless are getting paid for it you know in evenings and events that we do so absolutely you have to have reliable staff you have to have staff that have certifications you have to have staff that pass background checks you have to have staff that have a foundation of knowledge you know we could ask a lot of different questions from a lot of different directions about science all different disciplines of science so we need to have people that have a fundamental background in science so they can understand and answer those questions legitimately Mm -hmm. that's it so we have building it's an old building too. Remember this building was built in 1977, was not designed to be a science museum. Hey, she's strong though. Yes. Oh no, I'm not, I'm not knocking her, but I'm just telling you that we've had to take the space and make it our own. Upgrade. Exactly. And a lot of that is absolute sweat equity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Both staff and volunteers. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. We have some wonderful volunteers that have helped us to really fill out the space here, especially in our outdoor area, which you've probably seen since the pandemic has really blossomed and we have other ideas and other organizations impact 100 that's had a huge huge piece of the growth that we have had over the past you know 10 years since we've been here so other places that we get funding corporate sponsorships 
those are always fantastic when you can find organizations that have like-minded missions or they're looking to promote STEM education in a community, you know, and they come on board as either sponsors for events that we have, or they can just, you know, write a check. Or they Um, contribute group volunteer days too. Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. really helpful Mm -hmm. as well. I think a great example is MTSI. I was thinking Mills. That too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they sponsor Wolfgang. Yes. Right. right. Yeah. And yeah. they've come and done things on volunteer days and stuff mm-hmm. like that as well. Yeah. yeah. They're they're wonderful people. We love them an awful lot. MTSI, which sponsors our GEMS program mm-hmm. that allows us to partner with the Fort Walton Beach Library, allows us to offer that program absolutely free Mm -hmm. because we have somebody that underwrites the program for us. So we're basically running off of earned revenue, which is admissions, fees that we charge for programs that people pay, field trips. Field trips are absolutely... I mean, they're your mortgage makers. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're the things that will pay your mortgage having field trips. And it was really, really hard that year, two years during the pandemic when we had no field trips. Mm -hmm. That was very scary Mm -hmm. times. Definitely had to pivot to other types of programs, right? virtual programs and things like that, just to see Mm -hmm. what we could put out there. To keep the community engaged. And that's part of it too, is just awareness, just making people remember, oh yeah, Emerald Science Center. Center. Yeah, (laughs) it's a great place to take our kids and families. It's a great place for tourists to come visit. So a lot of it is earned revenue. So we do appreciate when you come in and you buy a family membership or you pay admissions to get in or you attend one of our fundraisers. Of course, our biggest fundraiser is our My Chemical Cocktail party that is in the spring going on year three in 2025. So yeah, that's really important to us. And it's a great community event and it's a lot of fun as well. The two places that we do get a little bit of tax funded money is one, is bed tax. Now that's paid on short-term rentals. So it is not on people that live in our community, but these are people that are visiting the community and that goes to the tourist development department (laughs) and it has a council that manages Mm -hmm. it, but that's part of the county, uh, part of Oglusa County. And there are laws set in the state of Florida that tell how that funding can be allocated and spent. So some of it goes back to the municipalities, which is the cities. Some of it goes to fund the actual staff and the tourist development department itself. Some of it goes into beach safety. Mm -hmm. But there's a cap on the percentage of the funds that's allowed to go back towards like the sheriff's department and the Destin Fire and Safety and organizations like that that provide safety for our visitors and guests when they're here in our community. And there is line item number five, which (laughs) says some of that funding can go back to museums and some other cultural organizations that do provide opportunities for guests to visit things like that as nonprofits. And so we do get very small amount. But it's up to the council to decide side that amount. Absolutely. Absolutely. They have some really great discretion in how they, and that's the tourist development department and what budget they put together and how much and to whom they give it to. So the focus in our area has not been on putting it back into museums. So they have a tens, tens, tens of millions of dollars <laughs> of money every year, and they give less than $100,000 to the eight eligible museums in our community. So that ends up being a, like $12,000 mm-hmm. a museum. Percentage wise, like a, yeah, very, 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 yeah. School. Mm-hmm. very small. And it's heartbreaking to me because I feel like this is a great way for them to invest into organizations that provide family friendly venues for you know it does rain Mm -hmm. you know and people get sunburned and some days (laughs) especially recently it's just been too hot Mm -hmm. to even think about being outside even if you're sitting on the beach it's been too hot to be thinking of yeah just (laughs) august really (laughs) but you know investments made into those museums which would then turn around and create new exhibits and new experiences for those tourists that come to visit our area also create this wonderful new exhibits for locals to take advantage of as well and museums have access for everybody Mm -hmm. so you could be two years old you could be 82 years old you could be a non-reader you could have physical mobility issues but you can still visit a museum so that's why to me I find it heartbreaking that we're not top priority 
yeah, we're not emphasizing supporting organizations that provide activities for people of all ages Mm -hmm. instead of creating things that are generally for people that are mobile enough to get outside and get on a boat Mm -hmm. and off a boat. With money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and this is a pet peeve and I get in trouble for speaking out about it. So I probably get in trouble for saying this, but it matters to me and Mm -hmm. my job is to advocate for my organization. I also feel it's my job to advocate for all the museums that are in Okaloosa County. Well, you know, us as museums, we hold all of your history and your culture. Even as a science center, there's history on our walls, literally. So, well, I mean, we tell you why we are who we are. Exactly. I mean, this is how we grew up. And I, and I say grew up. This is how our community grew up. This is why the things that we do, the things that make us unique are the things that we do and the things that make us unique because of the history Mm -hmm. and because of the natural environment that we have here. That's why all these people come. Mm -hmm. That's why they come to visit us here. And we have an opportunity to explain to them what makes our area so wonderful and beautiful and unique. And so they not only get to experience it, but they also get to understand it, which I think is important as well. So that's number one, taxpayer, but not taxpayer actually. It's a bed tax. So short-term rentals. And then number two is through the state of Florida has a program called Florida's Arts and Cultural Grants. They are run through the Florida Department of State. They have always been a line item in the budget every year. It is a very rigorous grant process. You have to submit a grant. You have to have letters of support. You have to be open a certain number of days of year. You have to provide certain amounts of programming and definitely analytics and metrics too. Oh, absolutely. Kate does a lot. Yeah. It takes our grant writer, Kate, who by the way is amazing. It takes her about two weeks to get this grant together. And then volunteers from other cultural organizations read and score the grants. And you have to have a score of 80 or higher in order to be eligible for the funding. And then there's always this statewide call that, you know, it has different tiers, different categories based on the size of your museum and your operating budget and the type of museum that you are and the type of funding. There's four different pots of money inside of this grant process. And it's that call. <laughs> and you have to sit on this call and they go through, the reviewers are on there and they go through and they go through the rubric and they talk about, you know, it's awful. I mean, because it's they like talk. It's like you're being peer reviewed exactly. while everyone else is listening to yeah, your Yeah, in front of all of your peers, which yeah. could be, you know, 30, 40 other museums. They're all on this call. The call lasts multiple hours. Mm-hmm. I remember this was the first year. It took us a couple of years to get into the grant cycle. I remember, I think it was year two. And I think Kate was on a cruise during the call. Call. And I was the one that had to be on the call. Uh-oh. And um, okay, first of all, I didn't know how to mute the phone call. So let's just start with that. This is how bad this was. And we had this bird at the time. Her name was Roz. And she was incredible incredibly loud and so she was down the hallway and she was just making all of this noise and I someone's like "Ah, they're not muted who's got that bird what's going on and these are like the grant reviewers talking about I'm like oh my gosh and they're like okay you need to press like star six everybody press star six to mute yourselves so I was just mortified and I'm like oh thank god they didn't know that it was me well a little bit later on it must not have been zoom then because you can tell who's muted and not muted now okay this was like a phone call. Like an actual like phone. Actual phone. And this was probably eight mm-hmm. years ago. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> this is like the second year that we had written this for this grant. So then there is this museum and it's the Museum of Shorebirds. And so the guy gets on there and it's his turn to be reviewed. And he goes, by the way, that wasn't me with the bird in the background. <laughs> Uh-oh. Yeah. So that's, that's where I started. <laughs> Nobody knew it was you, though, did they? But not the Shorebird Museum. <laughs> yeah, but it, they wanted to make sure yes. that everybody knew that it True. wasn't them. And I'm like, mm, well, now everybody knows because I just outed myself. But yeah, so it's a huge process. So every year there's like an ask. So all these museums, cultural organizations. So we're talking about like the Northwest Florida Ballet, Emerald Coast Theater Company. These are I'm just naming off some ones that are local. So you'll have some sort of point of reference for who we're talking about. Pensacola Little Theater, Pensacola Symphony Orchestra. So all of groups and organizations like this, they submit, they're reviewed, they're scored. And so maybe everybody, and this is over 600 different
different organizations across the state. And maybe the ask is, I know, I think one year it was like $93 million. So the legislature looks at this and they're like, oh, you know, we don't feel like we can fund. That's for the whole state. For the whole state. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, and for the four different pots of money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because there's four different ways that you can apply for. The largest one is just like the straight up museum grants. There are some that are like special projects, some that are like cultural organizations, not like a brick and mortar, but maybe events. So say the ask is $93 million. So it gets to the legislature and the house says, oh, okay, well, we're willing to put mm, $45 million at it. And maybe the Senate's like, oh, well, usually the Senate is more generous than the house. <laughs> and the Senate maybe says, oh, we'll give like $57 million towards it. So as they negotiate these budgets, and then they end up maybe with like $49 million for museum grants. So that means that you're not going to get but 45% of the funding that you're eligible for. Okay, Mm -hmm. so this is also based on your operational budget. So like smaller museums don't get as much money as larger museums, but also there's a cap. So we have some really big, crazy, wonderful museums in the state of Florida that are like multi, multi-million dollars operational budgets. Well, they're not going to get millions of dollars. There is a cap, I think. And please don't quote me, but I think the cap is $150,000. So it doesn't matter, you know, how big you are. You can only ask for up to a certain point in funding. Mm-hmm. So they negotiate. They get this number, 49% of the ask. And then they go back and they look at your scores and they run an algorithm. Them and they say, okay, well, where you would have been eligible for $90,000, now you're going to get 49% of that, which is, I don't know, maybe $46,000 or $45,000, something like that. And you have to tell how you're going to spend that money. So we usually spent that money on getting a brand new exhibit every year so that that way people would come back and have something new and fun to see. Well, museum exhibits cost fifteen dollars to $20,000 mm-hmm. to start with, mm-hmm. absolutely to start with. And that's just like a kind of a basic, I mean, I've been looking at this one exhibit that I want so bad, but it's $70,000. And <laughs> I know, I know we'll never get it. But anyway. I um, want to throw up. Yeah. <laughs> Is that an anatomy table? Oh, oh my yes. gosh. Oh, yeah. and I, that thing is so wicked cool. You can do so much stuff yeah. on it. But I won't ever have $70,000. Someone have to give you. <laughs> exactly. And and every year I just like poke them. Well, do you know of any grants that are that people have used to get that exhibit? Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, no. <laughs> so anyway, but the point is we try and always buy a new exhibit. We use it to underwrite some of the programs that we offer. Not all of our programs make a ton of money. And we need them to because we need to have earned revenue. So we underwrite some of those programs and buy the materials and supplies, Mm -hmm. our family science night program, for sure. And some of our homeschool programs, outreaches. I mean, when we go to these festivals and these community events, we've got one coming up this weekend. Well, And Thursday. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. So two this week, two community (laughs) events this week that we have to go to pay staff time for, have materials and supplies if we're doing a make and take or we're doing activities. Well, nobody pays us to go to those Mm -hmm. that's just stuff that we just do because it's part of our mission right so some of that funding helps to underwrite for us to be able to go to those types of events and if you don't go to those things a lot of those times those organizations that are asking you to be a part of it could potentially forget about you Mm -hmm. well I think it's part of like raising awareness Mm -hmm. so it's kind of part marketing but it's also kind of serving your mission Mm -hmm. which is for us to engage and inspire a scientifically literate community which means we need to be in the community Mm -hmm. We need to be there where the people are. And you want those people that are at those organizations to be like, oh, yes, there is a science museum here. You could go to this place. Mm -hmm. Well, and sometimes there are people that have like-minded missions. Missions, right. Mm -hmm. And and by working with them, you know, we're fulfilling our own mission. There's so many opportunities for collaboration. And we could talk about collaboration in an entirely different podcast because it is just so incredible in our community. But so that's the kind of things that we use this funding for. Well... This year, in the budget, it was $32 million. They had only decided the legislature was only going to fund two pots of the four pots of money, which would have been $32 million. One of them was $26 million, which was like the general one. And the other one was like a little over five, six, just something like that. Over 600 different cultural organizations throughout the state would have divvied up that funding amongst themselves. And the governor vetoed it. Like at the absolute last minute, everyone was shocked. Mm -hmm. That's never happened before, never in the history of this grant. I mean, it's just every year the percentage of funding fluctuates, right? But it's never not 
there. Mm-hmm. And everyone was blindsided. So this happened in the middle of June. Well, a lot of these organizations start their fiscal year July, <laughs> July, July 1st. 1st. Yeah. Right. So you've got all of these organizations that had anticipated getting whatever funding they thought they were going to get because they understood where the legislature had funded this, where it was in the budget. And then all of a sudden, somebody yanks that money out from under them two weeks ahead of the brand new fiscal year. So that was it. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's it. No Cultural no st- affairs. None. None for anyone, which just, it, it kind of struck me because I had a, a friend whose daughter is a school teacher here in Oglesa County, and she had been in one of the productions at Pensacola Little Theater. She was in their production this summer. And for months, she had been driving back and forth from here after school to rehearse, to practice. She's a dancer, and she's not getting paid for that. So that they could put on this Broadway production so that we could have joy. So that we could go on a date night and we could go see something and we could have culture. We could have the same things that you can find in bigger cities. And it basically felt like they said, the governor said, that's meaningless. Like, Mm -hmm. I I don't care. I don't care the sacrifices that you make. I don't care that you're putting all of this out there to try and make this a better place. Mm -hmm. And it's art, it's culture, it's things that are like not necessary to live, but they are the Mm -hmm. things that make living worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And I sat there and I listened at a Techman meeting and I listened to them talk about, you know, oh, how we're competing with all these other places to bring these businesses into the state of Florida. Well, what do businesses look for when they come? They want to have fun. They look for culture. But also Mm -hmm. some of those people that do those programs and that culture and the arts, Sometimes those people do need those things to live. They require Mm -hmm. on that to maybe the festival is some sort of fundraiser and they get money for it or their organization does, or it brings them joy because that's where they get it from Mm -hmm. by doing that to provide joy for other people. Well, and and it's individual artists too. Mm -hmm. I mean, and uh, these are people that this is how they live. They support themselves. Art, you know, uh, Maddie Kelly Arts was one of the organizations Mm -hmm. here locally. Symphonia, ourselves, Emerald Coast Theater Company and Northwest Florida Ballet all lost funding because Mm -hmm. of this. It was only like one point two million dollars across the panhandle organizations that lost funding most of them in Pensacola area but there's a couple here in Okaloosa County Walton County Arts Coalition the Walton County Arts Alliance is that what yeah it's okay yeah I think that's it yeah also lost funding and they do some really incredible stuff you guys should check mm-hmm. them out so mm-hmm. I guess my my takeaway to you is that hurt mm-hmm. <laughs> It hurt my feelings, okay? Mm. I'm not going to lie. It made me very, very angry because it felt like my government said the work that we do isn't important. And I see every day how important the work that we do is. And then my ask to you is support these organizations. Go see the play. Go to the museum. Go see the ballet. Go listen to the symphony. Mm -hmm. Come see us. Yeah, Yeah. come see us. (laughs) It's going to be a tough year. But we have just gone through that grant cycle again. It's very disheartening, right? Because you're like, all right, I just wrote this grant again. Mm -hmm. I am, they're out being reviewed right now. What's the point? Is there going to be funding for it next Mm -hmm. year? We just spent a lot of time and effort. And tell them, tell your representatives, tell your state government. Mm -hmm. This is important. It's important to all of us to have these organizations, to have these little moments outside of our everyday life that, you know, you know, spark imagination and creativity and joy and to see somebody else, you know, sharing the talents and the creativity and the gifts that they have with a larger audience, that that's what it means to be a human being. And I feel like that we got robbed of that this year. Mm -hmm. And so I'm asking you, I mean, obviously I'm going to ask you to come see us, but I'm also (laughs) asking you to see all of those things, you know, especially if it's not something that you've thought about doing before. I mean, this is the time. The time is to go do it right now. Um, Maddie Kelly also just put out all of their like plays and stuff that they're doing. I got a thing in the mail. Yeah. (laughs) Spider-Man. Oh, yeah. Dear Evan Hansen. <laughs> okay, but those, that's the different Maddie Kelly. That's the Arts Center. Do you, I would do you think that they are affected as well? I don't think so because I did mm. see the list of everybody because that's the mm. one that runs through the college. Oh, yes. okay. So, so they they probably have other 
funding resources and such. Right. But Maddie Kelly Arts Foundation, they do like the Festival of mm-hmm. the Arts in October. They do the stuff. concerts yeah. in the... Um, concerts in the village. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and they also have a really amazing military program. The, oh, is it yes, the uh, art program that they do that Melanie does? It's yes. absolutely fascinating. And But there's That's like a, right. a wounded warrior one or I something, think, yeah. something like that. And it is amazing. The, isn't it Zentangle? Yes. Yes. Oh, those are fun. They yeah. Are. And she's, Melanie over there is incredible. Mm-hmm. And that just kind of broke my heart when I saw that they lost funding because I was like, oh my gosh, some of the programming that they do is really, really mm-hmm. important, mm-hmm. especially to those people and those smaller targeted audiences that they're reaching out to. Mm-hmm. Unleashing that creativity is very important. So one of the things that we're getting ready to do is coming up on Nonprofit Day, which is August 17th. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we'll be reaching out on our social media platforms. There will be an ask. So mm-hmm. we'll also email and stuff like that. Kate will be right. sending Yeah, there'll be well. an email coming out as well. We're just trying to raise awareness so maybe this won't happen again. Yeah. yeah. Because it, it, it matters. It's mm-hmm. important. And, and we'll also be in two places that day if you want to come and visit us <laughs> <laughs> here and at the Fort Walton Beach Landing. It's the Clean Water mm-hmm. Festival uh, yes. on, on Saturday. Yep. Which, by the way, we're not getting paid to be there. Nope. So, <laughs> but so yeah, we just thought this was something that has just kind of been, you know, weighing on us all summer long. And I've been fussing about it in every <laughs> chance I get. And so why not fuss some more? <laughs> <laughs> Will this be the final time? Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> it's not over yet. It's, I mean, maybe next year if they come back and fund us 100% of the oh, ask. Yeah. That'd be nice. We'll seal yeah. our lips. Yeah. <laughs> then, I'll, then I'm over it. <laughs> No, I'm sorry, guys. Thanks so much for giving us this opportunity to to kind of clear up some misconceptions, give you some ideas of, you know, it's a struggle and how much we love and appreciate all that you do for us to make sure that, you know, we're still here, that we can keep going, especially for those of you that support us during the COVID time. I mean, we were just absolutely over the moon with the response that we got from the community to keep us viable and we're coming up on 10 years so mm-hmm. november so we're years. we're gonna do a party we're gonna do something to celebrate that 10 years mm-hmm. because i 10 Is that years in september October. No, it's November. 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 Because yep. okay. right around Thanksgiving time. Sunday was... before Thanksgiving. Yep. That's when we opened here at this location. Okay. So yeah, so keep your eyes and ears open for, we don't know what that is yet. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be some celebration and there, of course, will be cake. Oh, you know. absolutely. Because I'm always here for the cake. <laughs> yep. So I, I am talked out. <laughs> Go me. <laughs> Woo. So thank you guys for listening to this week's episode. We'll be back in two weeks with a new one. Until then, see you guys. Bye. Bye. Stay curious. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Cultivate Curiosity. If you have any questions, feel free to email us at socialmedia at ecscience.org. Tune in for our next episode in two weeks.